We left last week with the death of Mao's number two, Liu Xiaoqi, having been ousted from the party and then denied treatment for his diabetes. But what of his close ally, Deng Xiaoping? Now, Deng received a visit from Red Guards who forced Deng to kneel with his hands held in the airplane position for hours. Unlike Liu, he wasn't beaten, but in 1969, Mao had his fellow Long Marcher exiled to work in a tractor factory in the rural province of Jiangxi. If this wasn't bad enough, a worse fate would fall upon his son, Deng Pefeng, who was attacked by Red Guards at the top of his building at Beijing University. Now, either by being thrown off or from falling off himself, we don't really know, Deng Pefeng fell a few stories and was badly injured. And the university clinic actually refused him treatment, and so Deng became paralyzed from the waist down. The Red Guards weren't done with the Dungs though, and they targeted Dung's brother too, and although the details aren't clear, they hounded Dung's brother until he committed suicide. I don't think any story of the Cultural Revolution in the late 60s is more apt than this one. The relentless attacks of the Red Guards, the political assassinations, and the fact that any friend or family member of a class enemy was seen as free game. Yet amidst this chaos, Deng Xiaoping bid his time and patiently waited for his chance at revenge. Hello there. Okay, so if you haven't seen part one, I'd strongly recommend doing so before watching this one. And like I said, China was in chaos after a few years of revolution. For example, the city of Wuhan had 50 different Red Guard factions competing for control of the city. And so for cases like this, Lin's PLA stepped in and decided, well, which of these factions were the rightist faction that should be purged? And basically, rightist became code for the one that the PLA didn't like. In Tibet, thousands of monasteries, monks, and nuns were killed. In Jiangxi, the Revolutionary Committee decided that bullets were just a waste of metal, and that they would kill class enemies by chopping their ears off. In Qingcheng Jail, a prisoner reported of detainees being given drugs that induced terrorizing hallucinations that they were cut off from all light and that false executions would be announced to terrorize prisoners. And by the time we reached 1970, hundreds of thousands of Chinese were dying each year in the violence. Now, at the 9th CCP Congress in 1969, Lin Bao was named as Mao's successor, a title that previously belonged to Liu Xiaoqi. But the Congress had to solve the issue of three years of instability. No matter how much praise Mao gave to the Cultural Revolution, he had to acknowledge that there was a lack of any order in the country. He famously remarked that 70% of the revolution was good, but that 30% also was not. And if someone like Mao was willing to concede that 30% was not good, you can probably assume that what the revolution got wrong was more than 30%. And so the 1969 Congress was clear. The Red Guards enforced Mao's ideology, but the PLA enforced order and were to keep the country stable. And so from 1969 to 1971, 22 of the 29 provinces were under the control of PLA officers, and five out of eight ministerial appointments were given to people from the PLA. This put an insane amount of power in Lin Biao's hands as he was the boss of many politicians in two senses of the word. And so Mao grew suspicious of his new successor and began to spy on him with Lin and Mao becoming suspicious of each other. Lin's son actually encouraged him to attempt a coup. His argument, Mao was suspicious of Lu and look what happened to him, you're better to die trying than wait to be picked off. And so this is where we enter speculative territory, and I'm not going to try and weigh in on the why did Lin die conversation, but here's what we do know. In September of 1971, Lin Biao's plane crashed in Mongolia, and all nine passengers on board died. Now, China's explanation is that he tried to actually pull off the coup, and it didn't work, and so he sought to flee. But the alternative explanation is that Mao wanted to purge him, and when Lin caught news of this, he fled, and then his plane crashed. I don't know the truth. Nonetheless, Lin Biao was dead, and so the second supposed successor of Mao was taken out. But 1971 was also a really significant year for China for another reason too. Up until the 1970s, the US had not recognized the CCP as China's government, and the United Nations had actually given the Chinese seat to Chiang Kai-shek's Taiwanese government instead. However, because of the Sino-Soviet split, it strategically made sense for the Americans to ally with China against its Cold War enemy, the Soviets. China had just produced the hydrogen bomb and they were on the doorstep of the Soviets themselves. And so through Pakistan, President Nixon's National Security Advisor, Henry Kissinger, secretly flew to Beijing to meet with Zhao Enlai in 1971 and arranged a meeting for February 1972 with both Mao and Nixon there as well. At this time, thanks to the support of African nations, the UN also voted out Taiwan and instead voted in the CCP to represent China at the United Nations. Now, because Nixon's Republicans were a conservative base that wanted a hardline policy against communism, Nixon publicly acted as though he was annoyed with the vote, but in reality, 
he was actually pretty exciting. This was one step closer to making an ally with China against the USSR. So in February of 1972, Mao and Kissinger and then Zhao and Mao all sat down to meet together. Nixon would describe it as the week that changed the world and symbolically that was true because it ended decades of no contact, but practically nothing really got done at the meeting itself. Mao was old and far from sharp at this point, and so he had no interest in talking about policy and would divert any of Nixon's attempts to discuss policy. The only real policy point that came out of the conversations was that America agreed to stop the CIA from supporting rebels in Tibet. Nonetheless, the Sino-US relationship had begun, and without question, this has now become the world's most important relationship. But now to return back to the end of the Cultural Revolution. With Lin Biao dead, there was no clear successor for Mao. And with Mao very frail, he allowed Zhao and Lai to govern the country, though he still resented Zhao for his capitalist leanings back in the 60s. Mao's wife, Jiang Qing, was furious that she was passed over and her gang of four, and that's not the same gang of four as last week, this is the actual gang of four that emerged in the 70s, well they relentlessly attacked Zhao. And Zhao had an impossible job. He basically had to stabilize the country as best as possible and then deal with poor manufacturing results, poverty, and the Red Guard chaos. And so any reform he attempted to make was heavily criticized by Jiang's gang. But things got worse for Jiao. He contracted bladder cancer in 1972, and there was this twisted custom that in the Politburo, if a member needed major surgery, Mao had to sign off on that surgery. And so when Jiao needed surgery to address his cancers, Mao refused to give him permission. And as we moved towards 1973, Jiao's effectiveness in government was waning, and like Mao, he too became very frail. Mao was desperate. He couldn't admit that he was wrong on the revolution, but at the same time he couldn't give control over to the radicals like Jiang's Gang of Four, and then plunge China into worse chaos. Zhao needed a supporter to oppose the Gang of Four with, and a more moderate dog needed to enter the fight. And for once, Mao swallowed his pride, well at least kind of, and welcomed back none other than our exiled friend, Deng Xiaoping. Thanks for watching, make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel, it's free to do. And make sure to come back next week as we look at the end of the revolution and then the death of Mao. And we'll see you next time for our next venture into a fascinating part of history.